this is Aussie Mac Zone. We'll cover everything Apple, including Macs, iPhones, iPads, and more. All this from an Aussie perspective. Sit back, relax, and insert yourself into the zone. The Aussie Mac Zone. Okay. Hi everybody, welcome to show 324 Aussie Mac Zone. 324. Oh no, I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> One more, we've got 325, and there are yeah. only 25 episodes away from the big 350. Yeah, just keep the ticking them over. Monster. Keep ticking them over. Thanks tonight to IT Help to You and AussieTechRadio.com, our Aussie Apple ramblings this week. So, Vale Larry Tesla uh, is an early, uh, started, he's one of the guys that introduced the idea of the mouse and the graphical user interface to yeah. Steve Jobs. When Larry Tesla was at Xerox Park, yeah, and Steve Jobs came over to have a look at it. Yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, very important person. Yeah. So, born in 1945 in New York, Tesla went on to study computer science at Stanford, and after graduation, he dabbled in artificial intelligence research. Long before it came, became a deeply concerning tool and became involved in the anti-war and anti-corporate monopoly movements with companies like IBM as one of its deserving targets. In 1973, Tesla took a job at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Park, where he worked until 1980. Xerox Park is famously known for developing the mouse-driven graphical user interface we now all take for granted. And during this time at the lab, Tesla worked with Tim Mott to create a word processor called Gypsy that's best known for coining the terms cut, copy, and paste that we're all used to now. Yep. It all means something to us now. Cut, copy, and paste. That's, so. that's how you do it. Like that, that's it literally, and when you drop your, like, you know, your, your, uh, your menu down, it says copy, yep. cut, yep. and paste. That's it. But he's the one that, like, he's one of the ones that brought it into reality. Excellent. Yeah, so when they did this gypsy word processor. Uh, now, when it comes to commands re for removing, duplicating, reposition, chucking the text, etc., Xerox Park is also well known for not capitalizing on the groundbreaking research it did in terms of personal computing. So in 1980, Tesla transitioned to Apple Computer, where he worked until 1997. Over the years, he held countless positions in the company, including Vice President of AppleNet, Apple's in-house local area network system. Cool. And even served as Apple's chief scientist, a position at one time was held by Steve Wozniak. Yeah. And before he eventually led the company. So wow. in addition to his contributions to some of Apple's most famous hardware, Tesla was also known for his efforts to make software and user interfaces more accessible. In addition to the now uh, ubiquitous cut, copy and paste terminologies, Tesla was also an advocate for an approach to UI design known as mod -less, sorry, modeless computing, which is reflected in his personal website. In essence, it ensures that the user actions remain consistent throughout an operating system's various functions and app. So what it, basically, what we just think of it, cut, yeah. copy and paste, imagine yeah. if it was called something else in another word processor and something else in another word yeah. processor and something else in a, another video program. Yeah, and, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so, when they've opened a word processor, users now automatically assume that hitting any of the alphameric keys will result in the character showing up on screen. But there was a time when word processors could be switched between multiple modes where typing on the keyboard would either add characters to a document mm. or f show functional commands. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you, and um, yeah, condolences to his family, but thank you very much, Mr. Tesla. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, now, I'm really happy this week because nearly every story we've got is Australian. Oh, excellent. It's really good. So, Telstra has an issue, read the triple zero number and eSIMs. Yeah. So from Telstra, Hi, we have identified that your phone is using an eSIM profile. We are aware of a software issue where if you delete the eSIM profile associated with this device, 
and do not insert a physical SIM card, then you may be allowed to make triple O emergency calls. Wow. Well, in in, in 4G only, yeah. Yeah. I think that's changed that 4G, I yeah. think. Yeah. But if you want to deactivate your eSIM profile, please ensure you put in an alternative SIM card from any provider in your device and make a phone call to any number to activate it. We are working with device manufacturer as a priority to upgrade the software and fix the issue. Um, what's interesting is I haven't heard of anyone else having the issue. Yeah. Except also, but anyway. So the important bit of text, if you want to deactivate your eSIM profile, please ensure you put an alternative SIM card from any provider in the device and make a phone call to any number to activate it. Because, as you know, if, if you've got a phone where you take the SIM out, it'll still say emergency on yeah, the top. Yeah, that's right, SOS. What yeah. they're saying is it's not going to, you're not going to be able to ring emergency numbers. So, so you chuck a SIM card in it. Yeah. It'll sure. then pick it up, and then you can take that SIM card out, and it could, and it'd still make that number then. Well, is that right? Well, yeah, well, I think that's, yeah, that's right. That you can take saying? it out of one phone, put it in. Yeah. It would still make that phone, which is your iPhone 11 or yeah, whatever, yeah. only be able to make triple zero calls. Yeah, but that's fine. Like, yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah. But yeah. So, the important bit of text, <laughs> please ensure you put an alternative SIM card from any provider in the device and make a phone call to any number to act to, to, to sort of fully, fully get rid of the eSIM information. Now, also, Telstra... Cans its 100 megabit fiber to the node NBN plans. Yeah. So this is where you've got fiber to some point on the street. Yeah. And then it's using your ordinary telephone cable. Yeah. To come to your house. Yeah. So when the nation's biggest telco says it won't offer 100 megabit fiber to the node plans anymore, doesn't that say something profound about the quality of the national broadband network? Absolutely. That's precisely what Telstra has done, which is bad news if you're in an area with fibre to the node connectivity. I'm I not. <laughs> <laughs> so let us remind you, most of the country. So as yeah. reported by Comms Day, Telstra is ditching its 100 megabit per second plans for consumers on the most common type of fixed line MBN connection, fibre to the node. The move also affects customers on fibre to the curb and fibre to the building connections. But it's the fibre to the node space that the impact will most felt because that's the vast majority of actual MBN connections across Australia. Mm -hmm. So fibre to the curb and fibre to the building could be more capable of reaching those higher speeds because the conditions are only require the common cop the copper wire yeah. from the curb to yeah. your, or, or just that building yeah. to start with. Um, but where fibre to the node uses copper all the way to your local neighbourhood node, which could be hundreds of metres away. Yeah. And basically, yeah, so it goes on to say, a Telstra spokesman told Gizmodo Australia that it was temporarily ceasing sales of MBN 100 plans for fibre to the node customers. We have made a decision to only offer premium speed NBN 100 on fibre to the... Um, fibre to the premises yeah. and, and HFC which is I'll come to you in a minute yeah. for the time being Telstra isn't mincing words about why it's making this move the reason for this is because a number of our customers on FTN B and C do not have connections that are capable of achieving 100 megabits per second it is often the case that customers that sign up to these plans will subsequently notify that they cannot achieve top speed and end up downgrading or leaving the move leaves 100 megabit per second as the exclusive provenance of fibre to the premises and hybrid fibre coaxial HFC yeah. NBN customers. Uh, HFC NBN uses the old Telstra cable system laid down in the 90s, employing a mix of coax uh, from your home or office to a local fibre node. So, um, and, but they, that was everywhere. Why can't they use well, that? Well, I don't know why they can't use it. See, they made me change from the coax or cable internet yeah. to the NBN, which was an older system. Yeah. It no longer existed. And they had to then come in and put this line back in. 
Yeah. It's crap. It's uh, and uh, Coax was always going to be better than the... Yeah, than the clip, copper wire. Copper. Like, yeah. I, I don't know why. Like, it's ridiculous. Blame the government. This government is doing this to our internet system. Like, we should have fantastic internet. Yeah. Everywhere around the world has better internet than we do. So, NBN, because they don't want to spend the money. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what it is. Yeah. NBN Code did also purchase the HFC cable assets of Optus, but junked most of it once it became apparent how bad the connection of Optus's HFC network was. Telstra Spin is that it's doing to ensure customer satisfaction levels remain high. We want to ensure that these our customers have the best possible experience when connected to our plans and hope to have some better news soon. I don't know what that'll be. Mm. <laughs> But, um, yeah. So this week we're brought to you by Aussie Tech Head Radio. Uh, let me have a look. Here it is. AussieTechRadio.com. Yep. So there's um, podcasts like, uh, what's this one? E- EFTM. Yeah, the podcast. Two Blokes Talking Tech. Audio Pizza. Geeks Interrupted. Aussie Mac Design. Sounds like a great podcast. It does. Aussie Tech Heads. Uh, tech Webcast which, again, we can tell you, it hasn't been up for two years, but it's going to come back shortly, apparently. Vertical hold. And I think there's a couple of other new ones going on there, I think, as well. Awesome. So, yeah, looking forward to it. So don't forget, AussieTechRadio.com. Now, Zahn. Aha. Uh-huh. Any gaming news, buddy? Yes, there is some gaming news. Oh, there we go, look at that. I didn't even have to do it. So... <laughs> Cro- Crossy I'm, I'm Road. Here, I'm here to suck up to you. That's right. <laughs> Crossy Road Castle. It's a game we've all been waiting for from arcade. It's eight bit pandemonium with crazy levels, huge boss fights, fantastic color that brings back that awesome feel of eighties gaming. I'm talking like Mario Brothers, Sonic, the whole bit. Like this is fantastic. I love this game. So check it out. I I, I can't express how much this game is fantastic if you love that feel of, you know the through the levels fighting eight bit monsters big bosses you know then this is this is it like it's yeah it's it's really it's that good i gave it four out of five apples so when well, you're talking with so much enjoyment how come it only got four I don't give anything five. <laughs> I'm waiting for that one game. There has to be that one game that's going to get five. This is so good, though. I really, really like it. Um, so just check it out. Look, I could talk about it all day, but Crossy Road Castles. Just check it out yourself. Go Definitely. If you've got Arcade, download it. Play it. If you don't like it, delete it. But I'm guaranteeing you won't. So, so you had good fun. Yeah, I had I had a lot of fun. <laughs> you had so much fun. You only did one game all week. Well, no, I did t- I did two. <laughs> I, I did two games. Uh, I haven't. Uh, the notes will be there later on. Uh, but no, no, I have to save it because you've got to be able to talk about it. Well, there's <laughs> this one's not an arcade game. Oh, okay. This is why I didn't write it up. I was uh, I was gonna, but um, I've got to look. I've got to remember the name because I always get it wrong. So it's called Incredibox. Uh, I learned it at school. And um, I'm just going to go back there now. So uh, some kids at school showed me, showed me it in the music room. And it's just a bunch, a bunch of beatboxing sounds. You know, about eight different genres. It does cost money to get the full version. I think it's like four ninety nine for the full version. But it's great fun too. So you all these beatboxes and there's different sounds, different songs, they've got different um, beats as well. And if you've got a child from five to 15 that likes music and just wants to have a laugh, then it's really good fun. I've got my five-year-old jumping on and asking, can, can we play that beat game? I'm like, yeah, we can, because I enjoy Absolutely. it too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it involves them in the process of making music. Making music, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And if they can make music on the phone, 
then you know they'll be able to use programs later on in the laptop or on the computer and you know then you can go into recording all that sort of stuff you know the world's their oyster and i think starting at a young age playing with any sort of musical uh program instrument or anything like that is a great influence so yeah again i give that you know three and a half apples out of five yeah well one of the guys um who was interviewed this week on mac power users podcast yeah so he he does lots and lots and lots of apple scripts yeah i'm just trying to think what his name is um got a whole website just with apple scripts in it. anyway but he started off um with a commodore 64 yep. because it did good synthesizer music yeah uh, and then he started doing the his wife needed to do do something um some writing stuff mm-hmm. and so the mac was the easiest one to do that so that's how he started on the mac and then yep. he's been doing this apple script and stuff ever since but yeah um yeah, and he's and again, he needed one of music stuff. Mm-hmm. So and then he, you know, there was music software and music software, and even started making his, some of his own and that sort of thing. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, our tech guy, uh, well, one of the tech teachers, I should say, tech guy, because he's not, he's a tech teacher. Yeah. Uh, technology um, science uh, mandatory at school mm-hmm. uh, is an Apple user, right? and it shows you that. If the if the the best of the best are using this stuff, yeah, then wh- why are we bothering with anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Like you, you can tell you like just blast me on email yeah, or yeah. You know. no, that's all right because um, yes, there's there's a cost effective. But if you're only yeah. ever going to look at the web yeah. and do email, yeah, then yeah. You, by all means. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. There's some really nice, like the Windows tablets and stuff now. Mm. Not necessarily super fast, but yeah, yeah. we'll do those two jobs, no problem whatsoever. But as we mostly know, Apple people create, and yeah. Windows people consume. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was looking at a tablet slash little, you know, laptop thing yeah. that my dad's got the other day. It was actually yesterday. It's slow. It's boring. You know, you don't have that instant, you know, power and, yeah, uh, yeah that sort of stuff that you, that you want. Well, that I want anyway, yeah. you know, so, and that's why I do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got a little bit of Apple TV Plus news. Yep. So, just a reminder, when you do have Apple TV Plus, you can get Carpool Karaoke. Woohoo! And, and I hadn't seen it until going through on the weekend, searching some stuff. So I had never seen it before. Carpool Karaoke. Oh, well, I've seen Carpool Karaoke, but I didn't realise it was on Apple. Yeah. At the newer one. Yeah, and that's you know, uh, hosted was... by King uh, Ken Jong, is it? Oh, and no, that's the all individual. Oh, like, wow. Well, well, there's like four people in the car or three or four people in the car and that sort of stuff. Hey, Squidly. Hey, Doug. Thanks for watching. Yeah, hello, Karen. Yeah. So, now my wife and I have been watching a few episodes and enjoying them and learning things. So... Did you know that the female lead in the TV series Bones yeah. is the sister of the female lead in New Girl? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. I did not know that. Emily and Zoe Deschan- yeah, yeah. Deschanel or whatever they yeah, yeah. how you say their name? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I, I, I knew, I knew that, who the Bones girl, like, yeah. looking at her, I never knew what her name was. Yeah. And you know Zoe Deschanel. Do you know how I like, actually, I found that out because Kellyanne loves Bones. Uh, I, I like New Girl. It was really funny. Yeah. Uh, we both did, and we both you know, enjoyed Bones as well. And so I was just, as I always do, because I want to know who a character is, so I, yeah. I IMBD it, and uh, it came up with her. And I'm like, oh, I'll have a look at her as well. What's she doing? And then it turns out her last name was yeah. uh, Deschanel. Like, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. And then they, it's, there's their sister, so I look them up. And when they're together, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if they're not together, you wouldn't you wouldn't no, know. Like, no. But when, you, when they're together, you can see that, those features. So uh, they, they had Emily and Zoe. Yep. Yeah. And there's two guys from this other show in the car, and they're all four, four of them were singing and carrying on. Oh, having excellent. a great time. Yeah. Yeah, each one's about 20 minutes long. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of fun. Yeah. yeah Speaking so. of Apple TV, I need to get on that family share. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, don't forget, we've got IT help to you this week as well, which is that button there. How about that? So, yeah, you need any help? 
uh, ithelptoyou.com.au. Look it up. Send us an email. Ring us up. Whatever you like. Help anywhere, anytime. As much as we can. Greater Sydney area. Oh, even more. That's right. <laughs> That's why I said greater. Like Gosford, um, Wollongong, Lithgow. Like that's that's basically it. But the way it, it came about was because um, when we were doing the Apple repairs, we yeah. had the shop and doing the Apple repairs before they gave them all to one company. Yeah. We had to do fifty kilometres as the crow flies. Yeah. And you think, oh, that's you know, not that far, but there's a big difference between driving fifty kilometres or as the crow flies fifty kilometres. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, you know, you get up to Gosford and then you got to drive all the way out around the lake or that way or that way. Yeah. <laughs> like, adds another 20, 30 kilometres yeah. to the trip as it is. But anyway, it's all part of the fun. And hey, still, Nige. How you doing, mate? Still got customers from that. Is that which Nigel? Oh, uh, it's my mate, Nigel. Okay. Yeah. I've known Nigel since I was 13 years old. Good, good. Yeah, we went to school together. Because there's another Nigel. Yeah. I've listened sometimes, but yeah. uh, I was just going to ask how he's... Great know, boy. Yeah. Now, another Australian story, as I said. Australian housing provider launches home kit, smart homes, to en- enhance its disability accommodation. Oh, fantastic. Nine to five Mac reports, an Australian housing provider, Casa Capace, debuted two home kit equipped homes this week as part of an innovative disability accommodation pilot. For most of us, smart home accessories are just a simple convenience But for the highly dependent and disabled, smart home technology can be transformative. Residents can use the Home app or Siri on the HomePod to open doors, raise and lower blinds, adjust the thermostat and more. The pilot program will house six residents across the two newly built smart homes. If successful, it is likely that more homes in the same manner will be built. That's fantastic. It is. It is, yeah. The smart home elements are built into the KNX automation system, which can interface with HomeKit using a bridge. Right now, HomeKit is being used to control lights, blinds, curtains, air conditioning, unlock doors, control the TV and sound system in home. Excuse my God, sorry. Uh, as shown in the video that you can go to from the link, even the workspaces are connected to HomeKit, so occupants can use Siri to raise and lower the center island bench as appropriate. Which is awesome when you think, you know, there might be someone there who isn't in a wheelchair and someone who is in a wheelchair, for example. Yep. That workbench. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. It's so it's And it means you're all gonna do the housework too. Yeah. <laughs> My mate Link is a quadriplegic and he's always talking about this sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, and I think this is uh, it's a fantastic innovation. Now, just like a consumer installation, a home kit can be exposed through the home app on residents' iPhone, iPad, Mac, watch devices. The homes also feature home pods for comprehensive voice control. As home kit adds support for more types of accessories, Casa Capace will be able to easily integrate them into home kit app through the KNX bridge. Things like your garage door opener. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to get out and un- unload people in the rain and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know? Um, now the company expects to build 16 new smart homes this year with the potential to build more than 1500 in the years to come as investors come on board across Australia which is awesome it's great now what about you Tate I think this next one yeah. just waiting for it to come up on the teleprompter <laughs> <laughs> cyber attack forces cancellation of wool sale across Australia ABC Australia reported Thursday wool sales across Australia have been cancelled for the rest of the week after the IT system underpinning auctions and exporting was hit by a cyber attack. Key points. Apple... Oh, wait, is that meant to... No, no, no just uh, the, the... Uh, the system used widely in Australia and New Zealand has fallen victim to a ransomware attack that encrypted the trading database. Buyers say that the system can be restored over the weekend. It will have minimal impact on the market. Some in the industry believe this cyber attack highlights the vulnerability and relying too much on IT systems. 
Tama software, which is used by more than 75% of the wool industry across Australia and New Zealand, fell victim to ransomware, forcing the buying and trading system offline. The company's uh, research and development manager, Paramod, no, that can't be right, is it? Paramod Panday. Panday yeah. said uh, wool brokers' data had not been compromised. The attacker has encrypted all the files, he said. We did a regular check and the database were locked and eventually that means the software became becomes inoperable. On a weekly basis, the nation's wool export turns over about $60 million to $80 million. Mark Grave, Chief Executive of Australia Wool Exchange, said uh, he could not remember a similar incident impacting the industry. Not in my memory and not in my situation such as this, he said. We're working closely with uh, Tomlin, who are the largest system provider to the industry to restore sales to an operating level. We first found out on Tuesday morning and since then, there has been regular and progressive meetings to figure out what's next. He said cancelled. He said cancelled sales could be uh, relocated where necessary next week. Obviously, there are implications for growers, brokers, and traders who want to use the data and move um, orders and progress shipments that are underway. Sydney-based wool buyer Scott Carmody said that if the system could be restored over the weekend, it would have minimal impact on the market. The main impact is cash flow, especially for wool growers. They will be unable to get paid for the wool they intended to sell this week, he said. It means next week's sales will be twice as big and the extra wool uh, quantities on offer may flatten out and a prospect of increase in the price of the back low dollar uh, low Aussie dollar however most exporters still have orders to fill and overall there is not a lot of wool in the pipeline Mr. Carmody said the cyber attack showed the vulnerability in the sale system if individual businesses are relying on one form of backup data in the modern day that's uh, calling for trouble whether there needs to be significant changes uh, going forward I think it's a must. Yeah, yeah, you need to be able to, you know, keep it going. Yeah. But, but it can happen to would, anybody. Yeah, absolutely, well, anybody. Absolutely, I agree with that completely. Look, just because these guys are farmers doesn't mean they don't back their, you know, their uh, everything up twice. And, and you know, the, mm. these blokes aren't stupid. You know, they're businessmen, well, you know, yeah. first and foremostly. Yeah. You know, if they're, they're selling more than their businessmen, then they know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, so if they you know, if this has happened and they're going to have a backup, they'll have it sorted out and we'll be mm-hmm. up and rolling, I'm sure. Yeah. So, now, a leaked document shows Australian police use creepy Clearview AI facial recognition software. <laughs> Australian police forces have previously denied using controversial facial recognition software Clearview AI, but a new BuzzFeed report suggests employees within the organisations have undertaken thousands of searches using the software. According to internal Clearview AI data obtained by BuzzFeed News, four Australian police forces are alleged to have searched the Clearview AI database. The Australian Federal Police, as well as state police forces from Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, have reportedly run more than 1,000 searches. Concern regarding Clearview AI's technology first reared after a New York Times report revealed how far-reaching the software had become. With databases of 3 billion images scraped from social media sites such as Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, uh, Clearview is able to match a single image of the identity of those it holds. The man behind it is an Australian app developer, Hohen Ton That who's also responsible for Happy Appy and Video Ho, apps containing phishing features. After investments, so I don't know why he wasn't arrested for that in the first place, but Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, After investments from wealthy politicians and business people in the US, including a PayPal co-founder, Tom That began work on creating Clearview AI. 
Clearview is not available to the general public, but it offers free trials to law enforcement officers who can sign up using their official government email addresses. Gizmodo Australia has contacted the AFP, Queensland, Victorian and South Australian forces to confirm how many times it was used and under what circumstances. South Australia police denied the use of Clearview AI in their facial recognition department. Yep. Gizmodo Australia is seeking clarity if the software could be used by individual officers. Our information is that the location within SAPOL, which is responsible for facial recognition That's searching... South Australian Police. Yes. Has confirmed that they do not use Clearview AI, but a, uh, sent an email to Gizmodo Australia. Gizmodo Australia asked the AFP if it could confirm whether any AF, AFP email addresses had been used to sign up for Clearview access and whether they'd conducted any searches. It said it did not have that information, but requested it from Clearview. The AFP requested names associated with the accounts registering using AFP email addresses, but these have not been provided. Without this information, the AFP is not in a position to provide further information or comment, said an AFP spokesman. And there's more to the story, and there is a link in the show notes, of course. Look, this is from BuzzFeed. Um... Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if it's true or not, uh, it's from BuzzFeed. Uh, Gizmodo, great for reporting on it and things like that. And you know, if the yeah. police are using it, they're not saying so. Well, you know, it's BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> Optus claims world's first with a dual band 5G network. Optus 5G network now operates on both the two, uh, the 2300 megahertz and the 3500 megahertz bands in Sydney with Melbourne to follow soon as a battle for Australian 5G supremacy really starts to heat up. Optus have announced that it's rolled out a dual band 5G network in Sydney using the spectrum holding in the 2300 megahertz and 35 mega, mega mm, and 3500 megahertz bands and testing with the Samsung Galaxy S20 5G handset. The use of dual band is one way that uh, telcos can address the capacity requirement and coverage uh, limitations of current 5G technology. As long as, of course, as you're using a 5G device that supports connectivity across both bands. As we push ahead with the rollout of our 5G network, we are also continuing to test and implement a new way, a new ways of enhancing our 5G network. Initial findings from our dual band testing have showed that the use of these two spec, uh, spectrum bands delivered increased 5G capacity and coverage, uh, which if deployed will ultimately benefit our customers, said Ken Wu, Optus Head of Network Access Planning and Quality in, um, in a statement. Optus initially rolled out a dual band 5G in Sydney, but it said it plans to extend the rollout to Melbourne in the coming weeks. Optus underlining network partner in the rollout is Ericsson, who has also involved in Telstra's 5G rollout plans. Rival Vodafone, soon to be TPG, merged owned, emerged and owned. Hang on a minute. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. And using 5G, I'll talk about that in a minute. Equipment provided by Nokia Networks while... Um, Huawei? Huawei, thank you, <laughs> remains banned from providing 5G network equipment to Australian telcos. You can't have helped but notice that Australia's biggest three telcos are really jousting for attention when it comes to building out a new hype up, a new hype up with the 5G. Network, uh, Vodafone recently announced that its 5G network will be operational within a matter of weeks, while Telstra said this week talked uh, this week, talked up its early test of MM wave or double M wave 5G. Yeah, millimeter wave. What right. is it? Millimeter wave. Millimeter wave yeah. 5G, as we, as well as its plans to split pricing for different modes of 5G operations. Oh, so if you're going to use dual band, they're going to charge you twice as much. Uh, <laughs> Optus isn't. I. I I don't know. I'm not interested in 5G. And, uh, that. Can we just roll that back for a sec? Yeah. So, uh, where was it? Vodafone. There. Yeah. 
a rival Vodafone soon to be TPG merged and owned. Yeah, so uh, TPG so, and Vodafone are merging together. Okay, so does that mean TPG's buying Vodafone or vice versa? Do we know which one's which? Well, I think they're just... They're just going to merge? Yeah. yeah. Um, that sucks because I can't stand Vodafone, but I like TPG. <laughs> um, yeah, but it gives them twice as much. That coverage, yes, that's true. Hopefully. <laughs> Story eight. Yeah. So, Android malware, and, and there are Apple users that do use Android phones. That's why I've put yeah, it in here, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Before you start screaming at me. <laughs> Android malware can steal Google authentication to, sorry, Google Authenticator two-factor authentication codes. Now, I use this Google Authenticator to log into a particular website. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gives you a, like, you put your username and password in and it goes to the next site and you you type in this number from the authenticator. Yeah. And that proves that, like, you're in the, you're in the know of how the whole system works. Right? Yeah. So security researchers say that an Android malware strain can now extract and steal one-time passwords generated through Google Authenticator. A mobile app that's used as a two-factor authentication layer for many online accounts it doesn't have to be just for my website because mm-hmm. we go on. There are banking places that use it and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google launched the Authenticator mobile app in 2010. The app works by generating six to eight-digit long unique codes that users must enter in login forms while trying to access their accounts. Now, the code is only valid for one minute. Yeah. Like you can actually watch it count down, then it gives you another code. Count yeah. down. So if you, you know, if I'm in the middle of typing when it changes codes, yeah. it won't let me in. You've got to yeah. go back and do it again. Yeah. So Google launched Authenticator as an alternative to SMS based one time passcodes because they were hackable. Yeah. And because Google Authenticates are generated on a user's smartphone and never travel through insecure mobile networks. Online accounts who use authenticator codes as two-factor authentication layers are considered more secure than those protected by SMS-based codes. Mm. But Cerberus gets authenticator one-time point stealing capabilities. In a report published this week, security researchers from Dutch mobile security firm firm Threat Fabric say they've spotted an authenticator uh, one-time process stealing capability in recent samples of Cerberus a relatively new Android banking Trojan that launched in June 2019. Mm. Abusing the accessibility privileges, the Trojan can now also steal two-factor authentication codes. But like, yeah, okay, yes, they can steal them, but the bad is got to be watching you the same time you're logging into that app. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, we're talking... All this has got to happen within yeah. seconds. Seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Now, when the Authenticator app is running, the Trojan can get the content of the interface and send it to the to the baddies. Yeah. They added. Threat Fabric said that this new feature is not yet live in Kerberos version advertised and sold on hacking forums. We believe that this variant of Cerberus, Kerberos is still in the test phase but might be released soon, researchers said. Feature developed for bypassing two-factor authentication on banking accounts. All in all, Thread Fabric team points out that the current versions of Kerberos Banking Trojan are very advanced. They say Service now includes the name, the same breadth of features usually found in remote access Trojans, a superior class of malware. These RAT, which is remote access Trojan, features allow Kerberos service operators to remotely connect to an infected device use the owner's banking credentials to ac- access the online banking account and then use the feature to bypass the two-factor authentication. But if they're controlling the device anyway, you're in. You're already in. I don't quite get so, it. So, yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Uh, account, if present. Thread Fabric researchers believe the Kerberos Trojan will most likely use the feature to bypass authenticator-based two-factor authentication protections on online banking accounts However, there's nothing stopping hackers from bypassing authenticator base two on other types of accounts. These include email inboxes, coding repositories, social media accounts, intranets, and others. 
the hassle with doing it for say a coding repository is you make a little script mm. and have it in your code or you know you're mm. developing code for a new app mm. and they come along and chuck in their their bad stuff in your app before, yeah. and you don't even necessarily know yeah uh, social media accounts intranets and others historically very few hacker groups and even fewer malware strains have ever had the ability to bypass multi-factor authentication solutions if this feature will work as intended and will ship with Kerberos, this will put the banking trojan in an elite category of malware strains. So, um, even with your uh, Android phone, yeah. please, please, please pay attention. That's all. I'm not going to bag if you're using an Android, no. but just be aware of what what the challenges are. Yeah. With, um, you know apps that we're not quite aware of anything else buddy Good. no um, as i said i'm really happy that we had lots of australian yeah stories there absolutely. this week it's really good um be safe from the weather coming up yeah so there's yeah, gonna be lots of rain <laughs> I, know. I don't know what's going on i'm organizing my car trip for next sunday to a nice riverside setting mm -hmm. it's supposed to rain next week all week and including Sunday. Yep. Oh, that'll be every day this year. It's rain. Well, it had too much smoke in January, but yeah, yeah. it's just like, but it was foggy that our trip, our car, just having such a challenge. But anyway, um, show notes linked each week on when you upload the show. This week will be aussiemagzone.com.au forward slash AMZ324. There you'll see the last six weeks of show notes. You can email Zahn at Aussie Max Zone or Michael at Aussie Max Zone. Spotify, just search for Aussie Max Zone. Apple News, search for Aussie Max Zone. Thanks this week to AussieTechRadio.com. Apple Podcasts, it's just Aussie Max Zone. It has every single episode. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and IT help to you? You only want to listen from about 122, because that's when I'm there anyway. <laughs> oh, no, 222, was it? I can't remember now. I've been here for a little while. Yes. Uh, and our supporters, you are listening. There's most important people. Absolutely the most important people. Yes. Thank you. And over to you for the sign out, please, Zahn. Oh, it's just up to me now. All right. Well, guys, thanks again for this week. All the watchers, all the listeners. Yep, thank you, the can't, watchers. Can't wait to get some feedback from you. And we'll see you next week. Remember, an apple a day keeps the androids away. See you guys. Oh, thank you. Oh, 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 <laughs> bye. <laughs>